Well, good morning, Liverpool family. It is our last week of our series, Between the Lines, and I'm really excited about it. Um, it's a great, uh, I think there's a great message hidden in here for us today as Jesus kind of pokes his head out between the lines in an Old Testament book called Daniel. This is our seventh Sunday doing virtual church. And I uh, don't know how much longer this will be, um, but I want you as a church to rest assured that um, we, are, we are listening to the people who know what they are talking about, and we will not do anything stupid or irrational or rash when it comes to us getting back together completely. I do believe that that will happen one day. I don't know when, uh, but until then, we're going to trust God. We're going to continue to worship in our jammies from home. Okay, so... One of the greatest things about Jesus, one of my most favorite things about Jesus, is that he takes broken people and he repairs them. Jesus takes broken people and he repairs them. He takes broken situations and people with struggles and he turns them around. He takes us and our struggles and seemingly impossible situations and he reverses them flips them on their head, and does something completely different. He gives us all, uh, regardless of where we have been, new purpose, new meaning, and new life. Jesus has done this with me, and he continues to do this with me. I, it's not uh, a mystery. I've told you guys this before. In my life, I have struggled with loss and divorce and fear and insecurity and addiction and fears of abandonment and all sorts of things like that. Many times, many times I have found myself uh, in the doldrums of life wondering if it was possible to get out of that. Yet somehow and some way I find myself well loved by a wife, uh, well loved by children, well loved by a church who gave me this awesome jersey for my 10 year anniversary. I just wanna point this out that the Redskins got the number two pick, Chase Young. So we're coming for the Super Bowl now that Tom Brady's out of the way in Tampa. Um, we're coming for that. Uh, so I'm just excited. I, with all of the things that have gone on in my life, I still somehow find myself in a reasonably healthy situation, both physically and spiritually, because Jesus does impossible things. He pulls off impossible things all the time. This week on Facebook, I asked you the question, uh, what is something that seemed impossible that you were able to pull off? What's something that you did that seemed impossible that you were able to pull off? 24 hours later, there were more than 70 unique comments uh, about things that people had done and were able to pull off. They ranged from completing nursing school to getting children ready for the day. Uh, to convincing someone to marry them, which that sounds a bit like, I don't know, like kidnapping or something, I don't know. Uh, so donating a kidney, uh, dealing with the death of loved ones. Someone uh, said that they donated 10,000 meals with 20 volunteers. Others said overcoming sexual assault and abuse becoming debt-free. A friend of mine who lives in Alaska safely drove a boat in a hurricane, which sounds crazy to me. And uh, one, of the, one of the biggest ones on there was someone who decided to live when death seemed like a better option. There are so many responses about things that you were able to pull off in your life or that God pulled off in your life. Some of them were funny, some of them were painful, some of them were heartfelt, and there was everything in between. So today in our passage, we're going to go a little bit into the weeds to see something that I think Jesus pulled off. In the Old Testament, specifically in the book of Daniel, Jesus kind of pops his head up in between the lines there and shows Daniel something that would have previously been thought to be impossible. Daniel was a prophet. Now, a prophet in the Old Testament was just someone who you could just call them a messenger of God. God would give them a message, and their job was to disseminate that.
that message out to the people. God would speak to the prophet, and the prophet would speak to the people on behalf of God. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> which by the way, I'm not going to read the whole chapter today, but if you go and read Daniel chapter 7, you will, you will see in that chapter some of the most amazing, crazy things in the entire Bible. In, in Daniel 7, God gives Daniel a vision about all sorts of things that are going to happen in the future. Now, this vision that he gives Daniel, we have to understand, it would have been very, very difficult for him to describe accurately. He sees things like lions with eagles' wings, a leopard with wings, and even some sort of beast with iron teeth. Now, here's what I would warn everybody against. Because people have wasted their lives trying to figure out what every single one of these little things from Daniel chapter 7 means. And I do say waste your life. Now, some people might be upset with me about that. These people especially who, who want to discuss and talk about how the world is going to end and all the end time stuff and all this prophecies about who's going to die when and all that. And when somebody sneezes in the Middle East, they'll look back at a chapter like this and go, start going nuts. And they'll put a date on the calendar and say, this is when we're all going to die. And so I would just warn you against that because uh, basically uh, we can get into all that while we miss people in our life who need us. And so I don't want us to do that. But I do want to talk about one specific thing that happens in this vision. Um, we have to understand that God is giving Daniel this vision. And so Essentially what's happening is in this vision, Daniel is looking into a spiritual realm where he can see an image of God, he can see angels, he can see all sorts of things going on in this, in this passage. And he's doing his best to explain these magnificent and crazy things that he's seeing in this spiritual dimension. A lot of it is vague. <clears throat> a lot of it is vague. But there is one thing in specific that he sees that is easy enough to describe. Let's read Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. He says this, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. That's a very important word, that's why it's yellow on the screen. There was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, which is another nickname for God, the Father. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, this is a reference. This is a prophecy. This is a between-the-lines view of Jesus. And so in Daniel's vision, he sees Jesus, and he calls him one like a son of man. And in this passage, the one who is like a son of man approached God, went into God's presence, gained authority, gained glory, gained power. And the Bible, and he says there that people from all nations everywhere worshipped him. Now, this title, Son of Man, is a very interesting thing. And what's really funny about it is that through the Bible, it's, it's a very difficult title to pin down. But we know that it's an important title because throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the, the term son of man is used 192 times. And so it is a very important and powerful phrase, but what in the world does it actually mean? Son of man is, is a really kind of tough one to pin down exactly, but one thing is known. It refers to someone in the flesh. It refers to someone in the flesh, someone who is born just like any other person. All of us were born from flesh in this room. Everybody watching at home, we were born of flesh. And so Daniel looks into this vision and he sees the Son of Man becoming flesh, one like a Son of Man. And he is trying to put into words these incredible things that he is seeing. 
But when he refers to Jesus as the Son of Man, he is witnessing, he is seeing Jesus become flesh. He is witnessing Jesus become flesh in this vision. He is witnessing the Holy One of God, Jesus, casing himself in meat. Casing himself like some sort of like Jesus sausage. You know what I'm saying? He is witnessing himself, casing himself in meat. He is seeing the Holy One of God, Jesus, become flesh. Jesus was becoming flesh in this vision so that he could bring salvation to all people, establish his church, and as Daniel said, all nations and peoples will worship him. Now, this is an extremely important thing if we consider the question, was Jesus God in the flesh? Here's what I want to say about what's happening here. God pulled off the impossible in Jesus. God pulled off the impossible in Jesus. It was conceivably impossible for God to connect with people as individuals just because he was so big and he was so holy and he was so perfect and he was so pure. But in Jesus, the impossible happened. This impossible thing that happened is called the incarnation. Now, to me, this is a very interesting word. And if you go back and you break this word down some, you can see the word carna or carne in the middle of that word. And I don't know if you've ever had carne asada tacos. It's flesh. It's meat. And so Jesus became flesh. Jesus became meat. Uh, and actually, our very own Eduardo Encarnacion, who is running the slides and the, everything in the booth for us today, his last name, Encarnacion, is the Spanish version of the word in, incarnation. So Ed's name is actually a celebration of Jesus becoming flesh. Now, you could get that tattooed, you could do whatever you want, because that is a fact. His name and the, the word incarnation is a celebration, it is a, it is a description of of the holiness of God being cased in flesh in the person of Jesus. The incarnation had to happen so that all of humanity might know the power and love and presence of God. I don't say this a lot about myself, but I am someone who loves ants. Not aunts, like A-U-N-T-S, like ants, like the bug, ants. Like I, ants are my favorite animal on the planet. Like I have a little ant, I don't really have an ant terrarium, but you know, I'm Shannon won't allow it. But I love ants. Ants are my, and this is that special time of year where uh, ant, those big, huge black ants are just coming in your house. And man, it's just so much fun. I let them crawl all over me. I just love them so much. And uh, every now and then, uh, because I love ants so much, I'll see like an ant mound somewhere, and, uh, and I'll see like some danger. Like my dog Zoe is is she likes to eat ants and do crazy things with ants, uh, and yeah, it's gross. But uh, I'll see that, or I'll see like an ant mound about to get run over or stepped on or something, and I will look down at that ant mound and I'll go, "Hey, ants!" You guys have to leave. Something terrible is coming for you, and you have to go now. And the ants, uh, you know, they're, they're stubborn. They don't pay attention to me. They just walk away. They continue about their business. They do whatever they're going to do. And so if you think about it, what I would really have to do in order to warn those ants and to tell those ants how much I love them is I would have to become an ant myself, not an aunt. An ant, an A-N-T. I would have to become an ant myself. Be, you imagine there's an ant named Daniel. He looks up and he sees me becoming an ant. It would be son of ant. I would have to put on ant flesh in order to go and do that. Now, this is a ridiculous thing. I hate ants, actually. I'm just trying to describe the, uh, the magnificent thing that is happening. God being so big, so huge, so powerful, so holy, so apart, so away from us, in order for him to warn us and to tell us about his great love for us, his son, the Holy One of God, had to put on a flesh suit like the ones that we wear in order to talk to us about that. God pulled off 
something impossible in Jesus when he came to seek and to save and to rescue us. The title, Son of Man, is not a flattering title. It's not a flattering title. And potentially it has the, the, uh, it has the potential to insult the divine nature of Jesus. But here's what's exciting to me about what Jesus does. Jesus is always making something new out of something old. He's always taking something that could be an insult or could be less glorifying to him. And he's making that something great. He is always making something new out of something old. Jesus is constantly repurposing things and turning them into something which glorifies God. So Jesus takes this phrase, son of man, he flips the meaning and he actually uses it as his own title throughout the New Testament. Jesus took something unflattering, potentially insulting, and he turned it into something beautiful. I believe from the bottom of my heart that Jesus does that with us as well. I believe that Jesus takes all of our brokenness, all of our pain, all of the things that were intended to shame us or hurt us or bring us down. And I believe from the bottom of my heart that Jesus takes all of those things, flips them on their head, turns them around and uses them, uses us to bring glory to God. Think about your life. The trouble that you've been through or the heartache or the pain that you've been through or the struggles that you've had Jesus always takes those things when we allow him and turns them around to give glory to him he takes our past and he gives us new life you think of it like this my life was this and Jesus turned it into this I was heading in this direction but Jesus intervened and took me in this direction. Jesus is constantly, constantly redeeming broken people and repurposing our lives to do good things with us. Just like he repurposed the title, Son of Man, Jesus works in all of our lives to repurpose us into something greater. So yes, God pulled off something impossible in Jesus and God can pull off the impossible in you. Now, I better see some amen typing and some hearts and something flying up on the screen for that. Because this is the truth. This is one of the most central things about the gospel of Jesus. Is that although it may seem impossible, God can pull off the impossible in you. I was talking to a friend last week uh, who is a pastor down in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And... Uh, as we were texting about things going on in our life, things going on in church, uh, he posed the question, how in the world did we become preachers? How in the world did we become preachers? Because if you knew me, knew my past, you're not just uh, ridiculous. I'm pretty ridiculous still. But how ridiculous I was, it is amazing that God, that God put us into these positions, put me into this position. And maybe you look at your life and you see where you were five years ago, three years ago, one year ago, whatever it is, and you've never thought about this phrase that God has pulled off something impossible in you. If God is going to pull something impossible off in us, the very first thing, the very first step is for us to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves. Potentially the most humbling thing that Jesus said in the entire Bible comes from Mark 10, 45, where he said, the son of man, and there it is again, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Without humility, without voluntary humility, God cannot do the impossible in us. The first thing that we have to do is humble ourselves. Jesus, the Son of Man, uh, we have no idea what heaven looks like. We, we got a few words in the Bible about streets of gold and crystal seas and stuff like that. But man, we have no idea of how magnificent and glorious it is 
there in heaven with God, with Jesus. And Jesus humbled himself and left that place to put on a bag of flesh to let us know that he loves us, that he cares for us, that he wants us. He humbled himself from heavenly magnificence and glory and became flesh, made himself a sacrifice in order to take our sins away. When we admit our frailty, when we admit our weakness, when we can finally be honest about who we are, that is when God does his best work in us. God can do the impossible in all of us, but we first must humble ourselves. I'll tell you two things that humbling yourself mean. First is this, you have to take an honest assessment of yourself. You have to take an honest assessment of yourself. Am I too prideful? Am I too this? Am I too that? And, and honestly assess yourself in that moment. You have to take an honest assessment, and then you have to begin to ask God for help. Take an honest assessment of yourself, realize that you need God, and then begin to ask Him for help. And so when you do that, I think there's a few questions that we have to ask ourselves. Who am I really? Where do I really, really struggle? And in those places where I really struggle, where am I maybe lying to myself? Where am I maybe not being completely honest with myself about what's going on? What are my weaknesses? Why are those things my weaknesses? And then begin to ask God to help you in that struggle. Will you help me, God? to sort out my past and move forward. So I have said numerous times that I'm really thankful that Corona Apocalypse didn't happen uh, at a time where we didn't have the internet. I'm really glad that we have the internet, we're able to do this. Like we're not putting this on a VHS tape and sending it to everybody every week or anything like that. Uh, I'm really glad we're able to do that, but it is mildly disturbing some of the stuff that I see on social media. And if you're part of LCC, you know that I'm constantly uh, in a love-hate relationship with social media. Uh, and one of the things that I've been seeing a lot is this, this whole we're not in the same boat argument. You know, somebody will post about how something is going on, and then it becomes a contest on social media to say who you know who has the situation the worst and so to me this is a huge form of arrogance it is a huge form of arrogance to say well I see that you're struggling that way <clears throat> I see that and I raise it in fact I'm gonna go all in on this sort of thing and uh, we keep saying these things that are going on and this these arguments and these fights that are happening on social media and I just think it's ridiculous I think something we have to realize is that we're not all in the same boat. We are not all in the same boat. Uh, the church that we support in the Dominican Republic, in Palo Alto, they, those people are not in the same boat as any of us. Not, not one of them. Many of them don't have running water or floors. So you want to complain about you had to teach your kids or something didn't go right or you ran out of snacks or you constantly... Uh, to me, I think... There's a dose of humility that is required. I heard from the Dominican Republic this week that uh, they have mandatory curfews going on between uh, 5 a.m. and 6 p.m. And regardless of your age, if you are found outside of your home after 6 p.m., you are arrested. They are arresting children in the Dominican Republic if they are out past curfew. 10-year-olds in handcuffs. I mean, think about that for a minute. Now, go back over your social media and look at your list of complaints from the week. Where do we stand? One of the things that I think we need, and the thing that I think that Jesus has poked his head out between the lines to tell us this week, is humility. I think we have to have humility. And we have to voluntarily humble ourselves. We have to voluntarily do that. Our core value as a church is to love God, love others, and serve the world. 
love God, love others, and serve the world. This cannot happen. Cannot happen without humility. And so I'm going to say this because I've been, this has been on my mind for a while now. If you are waiting for all of this to be over so that you can get back to loving God, loving others, and serving the world, then I believe we are missing an opportunity to serve God regardless of our circumstances. Circumstances do not dictate our obedience to God. And humility is a trait that must lead the way. So I would encourage you, um, as we start to close here, to ask yourself this question. How can we humble ourselves and serve during these times of uncertainty? How can we humble ourselves and serve safely, don't be dumb, safely during these times of uncertainty? I would ask all of us to reflect on that and then act on that. Reflect on how we can serve, how we can love God, love others, and serve the world, and then act on those things with humility as our guide. I think the entire world would change if American Christianity would humble itself, would humble itself and allow God to be the one to do the work. Today, I want to ask all of us to pray, to ask God for a humble spirit. Ask God for a humble spirit and allow him to pull off the impossible in each one of us. So maybe you don't think that can happen. Maybe you don't think God can do something impossible in you. I would encourage you to humble yourself. Take that challenge. Humble yourself and see exactly what God can do in you when you give yourself to him, when you turn over arrogance and rely on humility. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today and for everything that you are. You are magnificent and mighty in our life, and we give ourselves to you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity for us to be here, to worship you, to celebrate life with you. Thank you that in so many of our lives, Lord, you have already pulled off impossible things. Some of us are still breathing because you pulled off something impossible. God, may we adapt your son, Jesus' spirit of humility and allow you to do something great in us, to pull off something impossible in each of us. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and give ourselves back over to you.